really, from the very bottom of my heart, I want to thank all of you for giving up an evening of your very busy lives to remind all of us who serve you in elected office that you actually care about this. Uh, and I know for all of you who have loved ones and families and jobs, and you probably have to get out of bed at ungodly hours. I see some of you are accountants and nurses and laborers and actors and all kinds of folks who have busy, right on time lives. So thank you very much. So why don't you give yourself a round of applause for being here. So I'm also just sort of amazed. I'm having a, an altered, out-of-body experience. Uh, we've got a group of federal members in Parliament uh, sitting in a town hall meeting, listening to people's concerns about climate change. For the last 10 years in Canada, that seems like an out-of-body experience for all of us. <laughs> because we have to have a little humility on the international stage. Because with Quebec, we've been very active. Uh, on, on, on meeting the previous Liberal government's commitment when they signed Kyoto. Uh, you might know that the only two jurisdictions in North America whose greenhouse gas emissions are below 1990 levels and are, track, are still tracking to meet the original Kyoto Accords, only two, that's Quebec and Ontario. Yeah, that's it, the one and only two. That means every other government state and jurisdiction in the Americas has carbon emissions that have gone up steeply and every other province in Canada, emissions are going up. Tough to be the federal government. Because 80% of the mechanisms for reducing carbon emissions are in the hands of provinces and municipalities, and the federal government gets to negotiate the treaties. And you may remember that most of the provinces were lined up between, uh, behind our newly elected federal government saying, go, 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 make a commitment stronger than Stephen Harper did in Paris, 14% below 1990 levels isn't enough. Well, let's just make sure all those premiers and provinces are there now that Paris is signed to actually make sure that every provincial action plan meets or exceeds the treaty we just signed. And all of us as voters have to hold the provinces to account for those reductions, right? Because we set building code standards. They set very few things, very few things. Almost all the things in your house, your car, your transit system, your energy system, building standards, transportation highways, all are provincial constitutional responsibilities. So the federal government is in the position of negotiating treaties on one end, and then having to negotiate even more difficultly with three territories and ten provinces to get them to do the things in time to do that. So we all need to be aware of our constitution and how it works, because we're the most decentralized country in the world, and we're the only country in the world in which oil and energy are a provincial responsibility. So every other, every other national government that signed those treaties, all the other 995, had control of energy and energy emissions. Our government doesn't. And the challenges in Alberta and BC aren't coming from really right-wing governments, you know. Just saying, okay? So a little humility on all of our parts, maybe, and a little understanding, a little bridge book. But I want to go back to the thing that you said tonight that struck me and, and really lifted my heart and my spirit and my soul as a human being. You referenced indigenous culture. So give, your, can you, give yourself a hand. And why is that so important? Because what is the climate crisis? Is it an economic crisis, a social crisis? Is it an environmental crisis? How do we get into the mess we got into? It's been a cultural crisis. How do we live our lives in our post-industrial, Eurocentric view of the world? 40-year election cycles? What do I have to do to get reelected? Kind of challenging for Rachel Lockley, don't you think? <laughs> it wasn't, that's not exactly the, the, the hotbed of social democracy and green activism, right? And there is a shining hope there to be worked with. Yes. And just remember, sometimes the enemy of good is perfect. <laughs> Number two, our business cycle that we drive often with much of our consumer purchases works on satisfying shareholder demand in the next fourth quarter. So that's our cultural values. We're consumers before we're citizens. We're taxpayers. We worry about our relationship and the complexity of relationship. Too often it's the taxes we pay and we measure the status of our lives in our society and we're raised by how much stuff we collect. That is a problem. 
That is a commodified, we've commodified our politics, we've commodified our lives, and we basically consume more per capita as Canadians than almost any other society in the world. And we must know somebody who fits that description. We throw out more garbage than any other society in the world. In Ontario, we throw out 777 kilograms of garbage every year. That's more stuff we throw out than entire civilizations in other parts of the world live on. So we have a zero waste bill to be a zero waste society, which means that we're trying to win Ontario with Bill 151, go from cradle to cradle, and be a zero waste society. That was just passed two weeks ago. legislation said 70% of their greenhouse gas emissions is coming from their zero waste circular economy bill, which is almost identical to ours. So let's compost, let's buy local food, yeah. let's design our products and our packaging for durability, let's stop designing everything for the dump. You know, it's amazing, from curry coffee cup things to styrofoam, there's a lot of stuff we can do to de-waste ourselves and decarbonize ourselves. And that's something that we have to do by example. I don't own a car. That doesn't mean there isn't a good minister's car when I have to go to Guelph because I'm a fat, pudgy guy like me can't cycle that fast back and forth. But you know, there's a lot of things that we have to do. But I just want to go back to this cultural issue because what do indigenous people talk about? Seven generations making decisions for our grandchildren's grandchildren. Could we actually be inspired by, by people like Josephine Mandeman, who's one of the elders that I get to work with every week, who walked 27,000 kilometers around the Great Lakes to help us understand the vulnerability of water, who helps all of us in government live in our world. I want you to, just, to start a diary, which I did, and look at what is the time frame you actually make a decision every day. And you'll be shocked how many decisions you make every day, and all of us as well-meaning people, that have a very short time horizon. And ask yourself, if you're making decisions for your grandkids, grand grandchildren, you live a very different life. So I think we have to have some humility in the face of indigenous people and learn from the elders and incorporate. You know, rather than the destruction of indigenous culture into the residential schools, could you imagine if the hand, we've handed off some of our children to some of the indigenous elders yeah. to go and live in nature? Yeah. How much a healthier society in nature? <laughs> And you should believe that water, air, land, and all of everything is sacred. That you're sacred. That I'm sacred. Can you imagine if we lived in a world where we all treated each other as sacred? Probably wouldn't have a lot of Orlando's around. Probably, we'd probably live with a, not a tolerance of difference, but a celebration of diversity. And that's part of our climate change agenda, because we have to be a culturally healthy society. People have to have self-esteem to be able to make changes in their life. And, and, and the other important piece is, as indigenous people say, it's all our relations, the rocks, the trees, the fish, the water. And the first treaties that indigenous people signed weren't with us. They were with nature. As a matter of fact, before an indigenous person kills a moose, they have to discuss the relationship they have. And when they fast, it's to recognize that without nature they would not survive. Can you imagine if all of us could incorporate and internalize in our culture that kind of philosophy? what a remarkably healthy society we would be, and much of the economic problems we have in our economic model would be solved. So what are we doing in Ontario? And you raised a lot of those things. We're adopting those principles when you read it, those indigenous cultural principles, and I just spent a couple of days in Thunder Bay with all of the 15 tribal council tables, all of the chiefs working on this, and they're helping write that. We're, it's based on the accord, the premier sign, sovereign to sovereign governance, and the joint implementation of our climate plan with First Nations, that they provide the cultural platform and the values that we can transfer into our own thinking in government. And my God, for all of us suits, that's one heck of a job. I've got a working group going down with Joseph and Andaman. I had to ask these business guys to spend three days by the lake away from work with Josephine to understand nature. I'll say to them. So what are we doing? Social equity, right? 
we put a price on carbon, what's the first billion dollars going to? The people who cause the least amount of problems are the poorest people in our society, right? So the first billion dollars isn't going to social housing retrofits, apartments, all of us who rent, who don't have control because we don't own our property and we don't have the ability to retrofit our buildings. So Ted McMeekin and I now went out and we're doing that and we're getting great support from the federal government. So one of the top order is retrofit every apartment, every rental unit, every social housing, and every co-op. And that's where those billions of dollars Switching out the heating and cooling system with fossil fuels, going to a retrofit batteries, solar panels, uh, net zero systems in your homes. You can buy a brand new home right now in Barrie or in London that's a net zero home and it comes without a heating and cooling bill because what is it using? It's using the 17 degrees 10 feet below your house as the heating and cooling system and better insulation and a solar panel and an inverter. And Mother Nature's, you know, your new utility and her bills are very cheap compared to the conventional ones. So but how do we deploy and retrofit every single building in Ontario? Because carbon tax. Carbon tax. Revenue okay. so neutral. I'm going to come to that. There are about three carbon taxes in the world. BC has one. Their emissions are going up 39% over the last 20 years. California, Quebec, and everyone who has a carbon market, emissions are dropping dramatically. Ours will be 15%. Because we have a cap, we have legislative caps, we withdraw permits to permit, and we will meet our target in 2020 by being 15% below, and we will be we will meet our target in 2030 of being 37% below. Remember, Canada's target is 14%. So Quebec and Ontario, which have, are the only jurisdictions in the Americas that are over 6.4%, we've exceeded our target that's going down. We closed all our coal plants, we introduced the feed-in tariff, we've introduced massive amount of solar and wind, and lost all of our seats in rural Ontario. That was great politically successful. <laughs> we've, had a little, we've been able to put our politics and our convictions where we are. But find me a jurisdiction that's going to put $180 or $150 ton on, per ton tax on carbon that's going to do that, please. And, and show the emissions leakage. So I'm not going to have that debate today, but I will gladly sit down with any group because I don't want to spend my time to arguing about carbon pricing mechanisms. I'm concerned that you hold government for a one that meets social equity. So we're putting now $160 billion in the next 12 years into infrastructure, much of that going into transit, the electrification of the entire go system, the building of the Jane French LRT, the new subways expansions, all the downtown relief line. You know, we're spending 13, 14 billion dollars a year on infrastructure. The previous government we took over from spent $1 billion. Wow. That electrification of the entire go system, which is now underway, is one of the most expensive things we're doing. <laughs> but we can't have diesel trains anywhere, not just on the Union Pearson Express. We've got to get rid of it. We've got to electrify the whole system, which is what we're doing. And when we run go to 15-minute service, the estimate is that go at our TTC and our transit systems will go from about 60 million riders a year to about 200 to 240 million. <laughs> Well, when you have 240 million because you're running a service that runs 15 minutes and not an hour, and everything is basically a surface subway, all of a sudden your costs don't go up because 240 million fares a year pays for a lot more service than 60 million, and it challenges this right-wing neoliberal idea that you were talking about that that by doing the VIA model, which is what the federal government previously done, which is cut trains and raise fares, means that no one rides the trains and it costs a small fortune. When you run GO service every 15 minutes, you electrify it, you run three and six year trains, and no one needs a schedule anymore, everyone starts using it, they don't drive their car, the price is low, and you have 240 million people paying whatever, a couple of bucks, three, four bucks a ride, it works. We're now trying to sh culturally shift to massive investment in infrastructure, 13 times what Mike Harris paid in rural and urban Ontario to actually build the value proposition that public services, when they're really good, everyone uses them, and if they're a user pay system like transit, they generate revenue not by increasing the burden on people, but by the sheer volume of demand being satisfied. And you heard that over and over again. Subways being built there every single year. They built the subway here in Toronto. LRT subways you hardly ever saw them go through 10 or 20 year gaps. We have the lowest per capita spending on infrastructure in Ontario for 40 years before we were elected in the country. Home retrofits, electric vehicles. Lots of people have to drive cars. $14,000 subsidy if you drive an electric vehicle, right? 
If you're a lower income person like, like many of us, who so I never bought a new car in my life, I was bought them second hand, you get cash from clunkers. You want to buy a second hand hybrid or that? You'll get money when you take your car into the scrappage, you'll get money to buy an electric vehicle. This is the most generous. We're, we're, we're actually going to give you 500 bucks if you put electric charging in your home. We'll actually give you a check for anything you plug your vehicle into, and we'll put uh, uh, very significant investments in transit. I, I don't want to go through every local food. Please buy local food. We import four billion dollars worth of food, much of it from California, which is in a severe drought where 80% of our vegetables come from. Food security is a lot about green infrastructure, and given the price of a dollar, vegetables are going to become more expensive, and it's a social equity issue if we can have people my friends here from St. Jamestown who are doing community gardens. That's just not about battling the heat island and the, all of the community garden program of green infrastructure. That's making sure that working and modest income families can actually secure healthy nutritional food. So we're going to have to relocalize our food source. But I, I, just, I won't go through all the things in the action plan, but I just want to leave with three thoughts. This is an existential crisis. Our boreal forest will be between 4 and 8 degrees warmer over the next 30 years. If you know much about Dennis Murray's work at Trent University or Dr. Keith Griffiths at NASA who are doing these things, we're not sure the boreal forest can survive a 4 to 8 degrees Celsius, whether black and white spruce trees can do that. And if our boreal forest slips into becoming a carbon source from the carbon sector, that's a much bigger problem than the human emissions. So one of the things we're prioritizing we need help from the federal government with is save our boreal forest, keep it as a healthy ecosystem, uh, understand the ecological Ride your bike, walk, take that newly electrified public transit or your new LRT, and if you get one in your neighborhood, the Ion in Kitchener or the Confederation Line in Ottawa, use electrified public transit, walk. If you do need to use a vehicle, use car share, or use an electric vehicle. Uh, these are the kinds of things. We're, we're going to put $200 million into cycling infrastructure in Ontario, the largest investment in cycling infrastructure in Ontario. of all of these generous programs with your co-op or renter on your home to help retrofit your home. We're going to be setting up a Vermont-style efficiency Vermont uh, utility that is actually an anti-energy consumption utility that is actually going to fund you to reduce your emissions and to get net zero uh, emissions in your home. And if you can go home and Google efficiency Vermont and you'll see that you get grants the same way you do for cars to get to net zero and a lower carbon emission. And this is a jobs revolution. This is the issue of uniforms, race is a just tradition. Do you know how many jobs there are when you're retrofitting every building? Because it's not capital intent. We're not building new buildings. It's all labor costs. It's all skills, right? Yeah. So the green revolution, the low carbon economy, is six times what the information technology revolution is. It's all local high skilled jobs. So when we're massively investing $8 billion on top of the $160 million infrastructure investment in Ontario that you saw in the action plan, that's massive investment in employment, and that, for the million people that are in social assistance, is a huge opportunity, because now, as you know, we also put free, your first college degree is free if you're under $83,000 or under $50,000, and your first, or your first university degree. So we're now upskilling the workforce into this low carbon technology, which is a jobs revolution that I think is probably the biggest kind of concept, and certainly as we go to execute, this is FDR, uh, you know, did, 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 did during the Depression. Retrofitting every home, building massive infrastructure. So go out there and fight for those things in Ontario and do that. But it's just those changes. Ride a bike, take an electric vehicle, use transit, buy local food, retrofit your home. It's a bigger threat than the Second World War, but no one has to go to war to die to win this war. All we have to do is make some lifestyle changes and think about our grandchildren's grandchildren. God bless, thank you so much for coming out. Tonight.